Okay, we're getting back to uniformitarianism and the original situation of the earth when it was first created, or first we go back in time, the evolutionists say there was one land mass, so did the biblicists. So take a look at this passage here. The file is k13.htm. And we'll look for, here again is a great. <clears throat> here again is a great difficulty for uniformitarian geology, where geologists and, and evolutionists say, we look at the present way things work, and this is the way they always work. But how do we account for such a remarkable state of things in terms of the present very non-uniform climates? That's not uniformitarian. With such extremes of heat and cold, and we look back at the original landmass that we both seem to agree occurred, especially when you look at the continents, all seven continents seem to fit each other, but they were moved apart, and lots of water now, and mountain ranges that were are more extreme now than they were before. Dr. Patton says, Devonian land plants are similar the world over, suggesting that climate was rather uniform. Wide distribution of richly phosphorous middle Paleozoic marine carbonate rocks, especially the great latitudinal spread of fossil reefs, suggests subtropical conditions the world over. It has long been felt that the average climate of the Earth through time has been milder and more homogeneous than it is today. <laughs> if so, the present certainly is not a very good key to the past in terms of climate. So we have the warm, equable climate characteristics of the entire Cretaceous period prevailed also over most of the world throughout the Jurassic with possible localized exceptions. This universal tropicality is difficult to explain. All right, we move on to the next topic. The flood required a unique atmospheric rainfall source, worldwide flood, when you come to that conclusion. And there are very many uh, legends, mythical ideas, accounts, and ancient history accounts from various parts of the world all over the millennia of history that we uh, both agree uh, occurred with man accounting for certain things. We look at a global rain continuing worldwide flood for 40 days as described in the Bible. It would have required a completely different mechanism for its production than is available at the present day. If all the water in our present atmosphere was suddenly precip precipitated, it would only suffice to cover the ground to an average depth of less than two inches. The process of evaporation could not have been effective during the rain, of course, since the atmosphere immediately above the earth was already at a saturation level. The normal hydrologic cycle would therefore have been incapable of supplying the tremendous amounts of rain the Bible record describes and many other uh, <coughs> accounts from different uh, peoples. The implication seems to that the antediluvian climatology and meteorology were much different from the present. There seems to have been an atmosphere source of water of an entirely different type and water of magnitude that now exists. Now, we, we can kind of tell how much water there was because we see at the continental shelves of the seven continents, we see shallow seas until they drop off. And then it's very deep. So we can kind of figure out at least how much water there was. There's a huge amount. We have the firmament canopy around the earth, described in the Bible and elsewhere. These verses, Genesis 1 and 2, 1, 1 to 2, show that even on the first day of creation, before God created light, God created the earth in a watery form. This is extremely important. Studies done by renowned physicists such as Dr. Russell Humphreys show that each molecule of water possesses a small electromagnetic field. When these molecules are aligned, the result is a composite electromagnetic charge of all the molecules of water that are aligned. When all these molecules are in composite agreement, alignment, you have the composite energy of all the molecules. 
So God began by creating the earth first in all the universe, even before creating the electromagnetic spectrum of light into the heavenly bodies, such as the sun and the stellar heavens. There is a strong indication that God first created the earth as a sphere of water. In other words, the life forms that God would create on day number three, vegetation, plants, trees, being in botanical form, would require the water. On day number five, God would design the fish and fowl. Each of these creatures would require this water. And on day number six, God would create insects, dinosaurs, man, women, and woman before the day was finished. So if you look at Genesis 1, 6 to 8, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Hmm. We have to dissect this a little bit. And God called the firmament heaven. Okay. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Notice an evening and a morning, second day, 24-hour literal day. <clears throat> God doesn't need more than 24 hours. He only needs a moment. He doesn't need billions of years. It is obvious from the biblical context that this firmament included two composite layers of water, <laughs> adjacent on each side with a firmament in the middle. How about a landmass? Some biblical exegetes have suggested that perhaps this firmament referred to the expanse, and the water on the surface of the earth was in one composite form. They also maintain that we had a bubble of water approximately 11 miles above the earth as a second layer. However, <clears throat> wow, the clear scriptural mandate is that this entire firmament was encased by layers of water on both sides as a composite part of the firmament. Later, the scripture describes the seas and oceans on the surface of the earth. Here it's Genesis 1.9. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place. Oh, okay. And let then the dry land appear. And it was so. So, we can therefore envision a model of the firmament approximately 11 miles above the surface of the earth. Water and land. We believe the firmament was approximately 11 miles above the surface because there exists a heat sink at that elevation. It's between minus minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit and minus 180 degrees at that elevation. <clears throat> solid water would be unbelievable crystalline solid ice. Nearer to the earth it is warmer and further from the earth it is warmer for at least one small space. If we were to amass the amounts of water present on earth and assimilate the greater amount of water, water within the earth, this would leave the approximate remainder of a 10 to 20 foot thick lineal dimension double encasement of water in solid crystalline, crystalline form as the firmament. Hmm. So here, 11 miles up in the stratospheric heavens, we have a firmament, not just water and cloud or vaporous, vaporous form, but in solid form because of the extreme cold. Clouds would cover the earth and sun would be able to get light to it. The Hebrew context shows that the water and the ferment are in a very special form. It was apparently in crystalline form, pure, transparent, relatively thin ice. It was probably no more than 20 feet thick at best. The Hebrew word used to describe this ferment is really quite astounding. <clears throat> in fact, if we do not follow the Hebrew literally, our model does not work at all. The biblical record has to be literal, or it isn't verifiable, really. This firmament had to be of literal composite, just as the scripture stated. No adjustments. The word used in the Hebrew to describe this firmament is pronounced, I think, rakia, which means to compress or pound out and stretch out this arch, arc of heaven, in thin metal sheets. <clears throat> On day number two, God concluded the creation of the day by saying it was good. On days three through six, he also concluded the days creation by saying it was good. However, on day number two, God did not say that it was good. On day number one, he had already pronounced it as good. He did not create new elements on day number two. 
He simply used the elements he created on day number two, the elements of hydrogen and oxygen. <clears throat> Many very fine scientific creation researchers have envisioned for decades that there was a greenhouse effect before the flood. And all probability, and in all probability, there was. The envision that there was a water vapor, perhaps in a cloud form, above the earth. However, if we simply use the vaporous form of water, the scriptural mandate in Genesis 1, 14, 18 cannot be fulfilled because it says the stars were set or enhanced, in other words, added in full dimension to this firmament. If the firmament cover had been water vapor, the stars would only have been seen in approximately 80% of the detail that we see today. Yet the biblical record says that they were enhanced. The original, original Hebrew word used is the, the word Nathan. The literal translation means that they were added or yielded in full dimension within this firmament. The only way this could have worked is for the word rakia to have a literal meaning. <clears throat> so what do we have? A superconductive canopy of compressed hydrogen in near metallic form. Hydrogen is a metal. It was encased above and below in a crystalline water. The, st the stars were shining at a distance, a startling characteristic of the pre-flood world. Genesis 1, 14 and 18, the stellar heavens are described. Take a look at this. <clears throat> then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night, <clears throat> and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. <clears throat> And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. <clears throat> and God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he made the stars also. And pl God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. <clears throat> so the stars are in color. And the biblical record states that God set the stars in the firmament. The ancients described the firmament as a vault above the earth. <clears throat> and the stars were placed in this vault. This is not what the biblical record says to us. The biblical record states, biblical record states that very clearly that God set the stars in the firmament, much as the jeweler would enhance a diamond by placing it on a background of black velvet. The word set is taken from the Hebrew word Nathan. It means to add and yield. In other words, the stars were not physically placed in the firmament because they are great distances away. But as light from the stars penetrates the firmament, there is a very strong magnetic field in the middle. <clears throat> it is superconductive without any resistance to the flow of electrons. On each side is an electromagnetic field charged to a lesser degree in the crystalline water foundation formation. <clears throat> what is then presented in, in a pressurized form on each side is, an, is a photomultiplier. Each photon of light which strikes the configuration is multiplied by 10 of the interaction in the atoms. On the earth side of the canopy, the stars were seen with 10 times the photons that the light brought to the outer surface of the canopy. Before the flood, the stars were seen by man as being about three times brighter than they are seen today. In other words, in the firmament, God set the stars or added and yielded the dimensions in full color. <clears throat> NASA has found that when a red filter is used in place, the stars appear in beautiful color. Try that. <clears throat> this is exciting because God put the stellar bodies in space for signs, for days, for months, and years. <clears throat> we understand that by observing the rotation of the earth in relation to the movement of the sun and moon, and other heavenly bodies, we can tell times. But now we can perceive that with the enhancement of light, those before the flood could, by the configuration of the stars, tell time at any moment. They, need, they would not need a Rolex watch. They would have something far better. Let me take a drink of water here. Now, in page 46, Dr. Ball goes on. <clears throat> Researcher Dan Cook spoke to one of the physicists involved in the hydrogen bomb project 
at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory.